In 1959, a small girl, a reckless, called Lucinda is in school. It's playtime, but she is away from the other kids, with voices whispering around her. Their teacher, Miss Taylor, comes to call off the play break. She had to call Lucinda separately because she wouldn't budge. Next, the teacher is in front of the class. She tells them that the school celebrates its opening with a competition in which students draw a picture of what they believe will happen in the future, who is guided by whispering voices to fill her paper with a series of numbers. Before she can write the final numbers, the allotted time for the task expires and Miss Taylor collects the students' drawings. The works are stored in a time capsule to be opened 50 years later. The next day, on the opening of William Dawes Elementary School, the principal welcomes everyone and announces the burial of the time capsule. Fifty years from now their descendants will dig this time capsule up after the time capsule was buried. Miss Taylor notices that Lucinda has gone from where she was. The staffs begin calling her name, looking for her within the school. Miss Taylor goes down a staircase and hears some noise behind a door. On opening the door, she finds frightened Lucinda with blood on her hands. She had written some things on the door with her fingers. This is the remaining numbers that she hasn't finished writing the day before. She looks very scared and asks the teacher to make the whispers stop. Fast forward to 50 years later, the movie's present day. An astrophysicist, John, finds it difficult to control his depression after losing his wife. He has trouble believing that there's meaning in life after his wife has died in a fire accident. He also has a son, Caleb, who also struggles to move on. The next morning, at Caleb's school, the current principal announces the unveiling of the 50-year-old legacy, the time capsule that was buried 50 years ago. She calls on old Miss Taylor, the same teacher from 50 years ago, to do the honors. The capsule is opened, and the children each receive an envelope. Caleb receives the letter from Lucinda and opens to find numbers on the paper instead of drawing like everyone else. While staring at the paper, he begins hearing whispers from everywhere and notices a figure standing far away from the school, but it's gone when he checks again. At home, Caleb tries to ask permission to go to a friend's place for a sleepover. While talking, his dad notices the paper from the school and queries him about it. He wasn't supposed to bring it home. Once John puts Caleb to bed, he starts to get curious about the list of numbers himself. He accidentally puts a whiskey glass on top of it, and it makes a circle around specific numbers. He puts a set of numbers on a whiteboard, and he quickly realizes that this means September 11, 2001. Of course, being the attack on the Twin Towers in New York City, which killed 2,996 people, lining up perfectly with these numbers. Certain that this is just a coincidence, he puts all the numbers on the whiteboard and investigates further. He figures out that the list is full of similar things. Dates, years, and lives lost at specific tragic events such as explosions, crashes, earthquakes, hurricanes, etc. These are all listed in the order that they would have happened since 1959. He uses red circle for the date of the tragedy and blue for the death count. But there are some encircled numbers that he can't quite figure out what they mean. So the next day, John talks to a colleague, Phil, about the numbers on the paper. He explains that every set of numbers matches a major disaster in date and lives lost, and the predictions of the numbers have been consistent. Even the date his wife died was also there. John tells him there are three sets of numbers that hasn't happened yet, and one of them showing 81 people would die somewhere tomorrow. Phil refuses to believe because it's too crazy to be true and thinks that the numbers are just coincidences, as there are also encircled numbers on the paper that apparently has no meaning. He suspects that someone may be playing a joke on John. John begins to search for more details. 
he goes to Miss Taylor, who was Lucinda's school teacher back in 1959, when the time capsule was buried. He wants to verify the authenticity of the letter. Miss Taylor confirms that this is the original, and tells John about Lucinda scratching on the door after the burial of the capsule, and the weird circumstances surrounding it. John expresses his desire to meet Lucinda, but it turns out that Lucinda had passed away due to a drug overdose several years ago. At home while trying to get some contacts over the phone, he sees a couple of strange men pull up to the yard in a car. Caleb goes up to the car, and the strange men give Caleb a rock without actually saying anything to him, which of course freaks John out. He reminds him to stay away from strangers and sends him inside the house. While searching through the net about Lucinda's death, his sister, Grace, startles him. Grace wants John to visit his family because he hasn't talked to his father for a very long time, but he refuses. John has a difficult relationship with his parents due to them being extremely religious and John is an atheist. The next day, on his way to pick Caleb up from school, John is stuck in traffic. He tries to reroute but no alternative route. Looking at the coordinates on his GPS, he realizes that the uncircled numbers he couldn't figure out on the list earlier are in fact coordinates of all the locations where the tragedies will happen, and he is exactly at that location. He leaves his car to find out why the road is blocked. While talking to the police, the prediction happened, an aeroplane falls to the ground, several people burn and die while he tries to help. He goes back home while still having trouble believing what just happened. John goes online to search about the accident only to find the report stating that 81 people have died at night. A strange man walks into Caleb's room. Caleb wakes up and the stranger shows him a revelation of everything being destroyed while the animals are running for their lives. Caleb screams. His father runs into the room and carries him from the floor. John sees a strange man through the window while holding him up and runs out looking for him, but he's gone. The next morning, John and his son trail a woman and her daughter to the museum. At the museum, he meets the woman and they introduce themselves. She's Diana, Lucinda's daughter. John later explained to her that he followed her to ask about her mother. Diana becomes upset at the mentioning of Lucinda. John explained that Lucinda's prediction had come true and only two remaining, and the last one will happen three days later. On October 19th and 33 people will die. He needs her help. However, Diana leaves with her daughter, Abby, saying she cannot help him. At home, there is news of a possible terrorist attacks. John searches the location of the next disaster using the GPS coordinates. He finds the location, a subway station, and tries to warn the police. John goes all the way to the subway station and chases a guy he thinks is a terrorist into the train. The police follows them. They discover that the guy is just a petty CD thief. The train sets to move but they see a derailed train heading towards them, and there's chaos as everyone tries to escape. The train kills a lot of people fitting the prediction once again. The next scene shows the survivors including John coming out of the debris, and the police and fire department trying to help. Returning home, he is surprised to see Diana and her daughter waiting for him. She proceeds to tell John that the last disaster left on the list is on October 19th, the same day Lucinda said she's supposed to die. Diana didn't want to talk with him about it in the first place because she hated the idea of knowing when one would die. Diana decides to bring John to Lucinda's former home, an old abandoned building where her mother used to hide from everyone around her. As they pull up, they realize that the last numbers on the list which followed the date October 19th weren't the numbers 33, but the backwards letters of E which they think are the initials of a name. At the house, John searches Lucinda's bedroom, where they found out that E in the last prediction means everyone will die. He also finds many of those black stones in the house, like the one Caleb received. Outside, Caleb and Abby are in the car waiting for them to return. They both start to hear whispers and see those strange figures. The whispers call on them to come. 
Poor Abby almost got taken, but Caleb uses the car horn to call attention. John and Diana run to them, but the strangers were gone. John sights one of them and runs after them, finally catching up to the man. He asks what he wants, but the man opens his mouth and huge bright light comes from it and he disappears. They return to John's house and can't believe her mother predicted the death of everyone tomorrow and this could be their last night together. The next morning, John wakes up seeing Abby's drawing suddenly. He realizes that the final disaster may have something to do with the son. John finds that the last prediction, which is tomorrow, was in tandem with a research he had done about super flares from the sun hitting the rest of the solar system and destroying everything. He quickly goes to the observatory and checks on the recent readings of the sun, which shows abnormal levels of solar radiation. He thinks that a large solar flare may occur very soon, and that may be the cause of humanity's destruction back at John's house. They prepare to go hide in an underground cave where Diana used to play as a child. It's time to go. He goes to call Caleb, but finds him at his desk writing a similar list that Lucinda did. From what Caleb was writing, he gets the sense that Lucinda's writing on the door 50 years ago is fundamental to the last prediction. So they go back to the school. He removes the particular door, takes it home, and begins to unveil the writing. Diana is impatient and wants to get to the caves before doom comes, so she steals the kids and drives to the caves. John finally gets the numbers from the door, and he assumes this is the coordinate where they can survive this disaster. But when he comes out, everyone has gone which prompts him to chase them from behind. Diana stops at a gas station. At the station, she watches the government announce that there's trouble coming, and everyone should take shelter, preferably underground. Diana goes to call John to tell him where they are. John tells her that the safe haven might be at Lucinda's old home according to the coordinates, but she's scared and refuses to go there. While still on the phone, the strangers steal her car with the kids inside. She also steals a car and tries to follow them, but runs into a half-truck. She breaks her neck and later dies in front of John at exactly 12 midnight according to her mother's prediction. John drives to Lucinda's abandoned home and follows a car-ridden path into the bush. He finds many of those black stones there. Finally, he sees one of the strange men and threatens to shoot. Caleb stops him and tells his father that the strangers have been protecting them this whole time and that they must go with them in order to be saved. It turns out that they were the ones who sent the messages about the major disasters trying to save humanity from being completely destroyed. They then reveal an arc up in the sky. John is astonished. It's time to go, but the strangers will only allow the children go with them. Only the chosen must go. Caleb cries. Caleb and his father say their last goodbyes, and the men turn to shining bodies, and the ark leaves. Up in the sky, many of such ark had come to several other places on earth. They are also leaving. John wakes up in the morning on that ground. He navigates the now rowdy city to his family house. His sister meets him with a hug and he tells her Caleb is safe. He enters the house and hugs his father, then his mother, and his sister joins for a group hug. The sun flare starts to destroy everything and takes them two in their group hug. As the movie ends, 